The scenario was clear. As the Cold War turns hot, a field of warfare, eerily quiet yet tense, stretches before a small team of American soldiers. Under a heavy sky, they hastily set up a newly developed weapon, their movements precise yet urgent. The recoilless rifle system, named the Davy Crockett, is aimed at a distant target, the Soviet tank. Once the weapon is set, the team pulls the firing cord. As they sprint away, the air is thick with the unspoken truth. The Davy Crockett is more than just a rifle. It's the world's smallest nuclear weapon. A powerful tool in their arsenal, the Davy, nuclear abilities were now at the fingertips of even the smallest military units. Today, the use of nuclear weapons is understood only as a last resort. Yet, back in the 1950s, amidst a frosty atmosphere of global tension, the rules were different. And the Davy Crockett epitomized a readiness to cross the boundaries of the unthinkable. It was the 1950s. The Cold War was at its peak, and the deployment of nuclear weapons against Japan had ushered in a new age of warfare. To many people around the globe, it seemed like sooner rather than later, the Soviet Red Army would exploit its numerical superiority with a powerful and overwhelming nuclear attack against the West. With a single weapon and in the blink of an eye, entire cities could be destroyed. Initially, war planners believed the only way to counter this looming threat was to simply have more atomic weapons. Even President Eisenhower stated in his memoirs that, quote, My feeling was then, and still remains, that it would be impossible for the United States to maintain the military commitments which it now sustains around the world without turning into a garrison state, did we not possess atomic weapons and the will to use them when necessary. When Eisenhower first became the president in 1953, the total American nuclear stockpile was approaching 1,000. By the time he left eight years later, that number had grown to over 20,000. However, their widespread use would have almost certainly caused mutually assured destruction or mad. It was clear the United States needed a middle ground. By the late 1950s, military planners were beginning to think nuclear materials were not merely assets to deter conflict. They could also be made into munitions, ready for use in actual warfare. Beginning in 1957, the U.S. Army's Airborne and Infantry Divisions were reorganized into pentomic divisions, tailored for combat on nuclear battlefields. The strategic shift, aimed at countering the nuclear threat, led to the development of compact, tactical nuclear tools that could deliver the power of atomic weaponry directly into the hands of frontline soldiers. In late 1957, the Atomic Energy Commission announced that people at the agency had successfully designed a lightweight, sub-kiloton yield fission warhead. The commission charged the Army's Chief of Ordnance, Major General John H. Henricks, to incorporate this recently finished miniature warhead with a brand new weapon system. Under the Battlegroup Atomic Delivery System, or BGADS, program, work on the project began, becoming the first ever assigned to the United States Army Weapon Command in Rock Island, Illinois. Because Army Chief of Staff General Maxwell D. Taylor considered the development of the BGADS as a critical component of the Army's new pentomic divisions, this project became one of the most dedicated developments in the entire army, with officials exploring as many as 20 different delivery systems, including guided missiles, standard artillery, and mortars. However, the army chose the simplest and lightest option, a recoilless rifle system, and by August of that same year, the BGAD's design was becoming known as the Davy Crockett, named after the American folk hero, frontiersman, soldier, and politician. In November, the Ordnance Corps delivered the first prototype recoilless rifle tube at Picatinny Arsenal. After years of development and tests throughout America, the M28-M29 Davy Crockett finally entered service in May 1961. Starting in 1961, the Army began fielding the Davy Crockett recoilless rifle system to American infantry units in West Germany, South Korea, Guam, Hawaii, and Okinawa. The weapon was designed to be used against rapidly advancing formations of Soviet, Warsaw Pact, and North Korean troops, thus allowing a very small number of American service members to take out about a dozen enemy tanks at once, giving the U.S. Army an extra punch should the Cold War turn hot. The heart of this weapon consisted of the XM-388 nuclear projectile. With a bulbous body and small tail fins that popped out to stabilize it mid-flight, the projectile was a strange sight. The XM-388 
which looked like a cartoon caricature of a bomb, also earned the nickname of the Atomic Watermelon. It was also one of the smallest nuclear devices ever developed, weighing 76 pounds and measuring 30 inches long by 11 inches wide. Within the XM-388 was the small nuclear weapon deployed by the United States Armed Forces, the W-54 warhead. Weighing 51 pounds, it had an explosive yield of approximately 10 to 20 tons. The Davy Crockett was produced in two separate variants, the light M28 120mm recoilless rifle with a range of approximately 1.25 miles, and the less used heavy M29 155mm recoilless rifle out to 2.5 miles. Both versions of the Davy Crockett were operated by three soldiers and mounted upon a jeep vehicle. One of the most fervent supporters of the weapon outside the U.S. was Franz Josef Strauss, West Germany's defense minister, who personally promoted the idea of equipping German brigades with the nuclear weapons supplied by the U.S., as he believed that a single Davy Crockett could replace up to 50 salvos of a whole divisional artillery park. But NATO commanders strongly opposed Strauss's ideas, and the weapon would remain in American hands only. And as the Davy Crockett system was deployed across various U.S. military units, the need to thoroughly test and demonstrate its capabilities became paramount. On July 17, 1962, at the Nevada test site in southern Nevada, a crowd of 396 spectators, including the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Maxwell Taylor, and the U.S. Attorney General and brother of the newly elected President, Robert F. Kennedy, were braving the sun to witness the last atmospheric test ever conducted by the United States. From a distance of approximately only two miles, these men and women were about to see the first ever firing of a Davy Crockett recoilless rifle weapon system called the Little Feller One-Shot. The fourth and last test of the Dominic II series, Little Feller One, was part of a series of 105 nuclear tests conducted by the United States in 1962 during a period of heightened tensions in the Cold War, particularly after the Soviet Union resumed nuclear testing. Ten days before, the Little Feller II test had only consisted of a troop maneuver and an observer program. But that day, for the ultimate test of the weapon that would reveal its true potential and limitations, Little Feller I would involve the largest number of military troops, over a thousand personnel, to ever participate in a nuclear test. After arriving at the exercise ground area, the troops practiced firing the Davy Crockett launchers, while scientific personnel checked instrumentation in the target area. Up above, a single L-20 aircraft surveyed the area to ensure that not a single unauthorized person was in the vicinity. Half an hour before, the Atomic Energy Commission started the countdown for Little Feller 1, and all personnel in the test site went to their trenches. Five personnel launched the weapon from the Davy Crockett launcher, mounted on an armored personnel carrier, as the clock counted down. As the weapon fired away, the observers in the bleachers watched with protective goggles. They bore witness to Little Feller 1's detonation, three feet above the surface, on a target 2,796 feet away from the firing position. Only a single live Davy Crockett round would ever be fired. By then, the collective view of nuclear warfare had begun to change, especially when new President John F. Kennedy and Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev stood eye to eye over Cuba in a frightening confrontation three months after the test. But the views on the weapon had also changed. From the very beginning, data gathered from testing inert rounds was shocking. It was too inaccurate to deliver even low-yield nuclear fires. This factor soon became a snowball effect of possibilities that derailed the entire program. The first problem was the serious concerns about their practicality in a real combat scenario, including the heightened risk of friendly fire or unintended collateral damage, especially given the nuclear nature of the Davy Crockett and the high-pressure dynamics of warfare. Another issue was the weapon's short range, especially posing a real threat to its three-man crews. Should the wind veer even a bit too much, these soldiers would find themselves at risk of receiving a significant dose of radiation. Aware that those within the 1.25 miles of the blast of the M28 light version were potential targets for nuclear material, the Army told servicemen to only deploy the recoilless gun from behind the hill, to not move, and to keep their heads down until the warhead had detonated. Another, more ethical issue was that while the Americans would be aware of the precaution, the enemy, of course, would not. But the dangers of radioactive fallout weren't enough. 
the entire concept of nuclear battlefields was flawed. It was a nearly unanimous belief amongst the personnel associated with the development of the Davy Crockett that using the weapon would evolve into a large conflict. While nuclear power was at the fingertips of every soldier with the Davy Crockett, this meant that even a random and unwilling sergeant had the potential to start a nuclear war. Almost one year after the Littlefeller test, in June 1963, President Kennedy announced that after years of talks, the United States, the Soviet Union, and the United Kingdom would take part in the Moscow Treaty, or the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. This document, which became effective in October of that year, completely banned nuclear weapons tests in the atmosphere, outer space, and underwater. The treaty allowed underground atomic testing, as long as radioactive debris remained within the territorial borders of the testing nation. Despite its faults, a total of 2,100 Davy Crockett's were produced. The growing realization of the impracticality and potential dangers of Davy Crockett led to it being phased out of service with U.S. forces in Europe beginning in 1967, leaving the 82nd Airborne Division's 55th and 56th Infantry Platoons as the only remaining wielders of the recoilless gun, until those were deactivated in 1968. Still, smaller nuclear weapons remained part of the U.S. arsenal from then on. Even the W-54 warhead was reused in the 1980s as a small, backpack-sized nuclear landmine, ready to destroy bridges and collapse pads to stop invading Soviet forces. But the idea of limited nuclear war has not gone away entirely. In 2018, nuclear battlefield weapons came back on the news when President Donald Trump's nuclear posture review changed and called for the development of a duo of new nuclear systems with a battlefield role. Even more recently, in June 2022, the United States Congress approved funding for a nuclear-armed sea-launched cruise missile with a low-yield warhead. And once again, even more than 50 years since the decommissioning of the Davy Crockett nuclear recoilless rifle, the potential snowball-escalating effect is still a concern for U.S. military leaders. <laughs>